We're joined this morning by the leaders of this effort, Ken and Ken. Ken Frazier, chairman and CEO of Merck, and Ken Chenault, uh, chairman and managing director of General Catalyst. He is, of course, the former chairman and CEO of American Express. Uh, and we um, are privileged to have both of you on the program uh, this morning um, with this historic open letter uh, to your peers in corporate America to take action. Um, so uh, let me start with you, Ken Chenault. And I, I guess I'm going to have to call, call one Chenault and one Frazier in this case. Um, Tell us how this came to be, uh, because this does appear to be the first time uh, a group of, of, of leaders of your prominence ha have come together uh, on an issue like this in such a forceful way. So, Andrew, this is the first time. And I think what's very important is to understand the history of voting rights in America. We all know the right to vote is fundamental. But for African Americans, they had to earn the right to vote. They had to demonstrate. And anyone who has followed American history understands that the vote is absolutely crucial. Just think if we had the right to vote, Blacks had the right to vote after the Civil War, where this country would have been. Just think after the Brown v. Board of Education case. If corporations had stood up and said, we support the integration of schools. And so what I think is very important here is that we are asking corporations, and this is a call for action. What we have heard from corporations is general statements about their support for voting rights and against voter suppression. But now we're asking, put those words into action. And we're asking corporate America to publicly and directly oppose any discriminatory legislation and all measures designed to limit America's ability to vote. Americans must vote black Americans must vote. And it would, when it comes to protecting the rights of all Americans to vote, there can be no middle ground. We cannot be in the business of creating unjust and undemocratic laws in an attempt to thwart the will of the people. And so what we're saying is this is fundamentally un-American and Corporations have to stand up. There is no middle ground. And so we put together a group starting Sunday afternoon. And this has been a source of conversation over the last 10 days in the Black community and clearly from Blacks in corporate America. So I want to emphasize this is about all Americans having the right to vote, but we need to recognize the special history of the denial of right to vote for right. black Americans, and we will not be silent. Ken Frazier, um, when you look at corporate America today and you look at the, the, the statements that have been made since the, since the murder of George Floyd, and I'll never forget you coming on our broadcast, uh, literally uh, several mornings right after that, uh, that, that, that tragic day, um, there has been a, a silence to some extent. As, as, as Ken Chenault just said, there have been general statements made about it. But when it comes to this issue of voter suppression, um, you have not seen the big companies come out publicly uh, as aggressively as you are calling on them to do, especially in, in states like Georgia, um, Coca-Cola, Delta, Home Depot. What have your conversations been with your peers, uh, not just in this group, but across the country around this topic? Well, thank you for having me, Andrew. I've had some conversations. I think people are trying to get their heads around it. And I think it's important at the outset for people to understand what's wrong with this law, because it's a very long, complicated law. But if you'll just give me a minute, I want to explain to your viewers why we feel so strongly about this law, and particularly 
how this law could be the prototype for a lot of bad laws. So let me start by talking about some facts about Georgia. Over the past few years, the number of registered voters in Georgia has gone up by 2 million. Roughly half of the registered voters in Georgia live in the nine county metropolitan Atlanta area. We know in the past elections uh, that the wait lines have been hours, up to five hours in that area. Uh, the area, of course, is much more densely populated. It tends to lean Democratic, and it happens to be more non-white than other areas. In fact, people who vote in counties that are largely white um, spend, on average, something like six minutes in line if they come out to work. If you're in a, a county that's largely non-white, you spend 51 minutes. On average, Black voters stand in line about nine times longer than white voters before we make these changes. So now, within two months of a runoff, a close runoff election in Georgia, we make a number of changes that are actually intended to make it more difficult for people to vote in a convenient, reliable, and secure manner. So let me just tell you about a few of them. In Georgia, they had secure drop boxes. Okay, in Fulton County, the most populous area of Atlanta, this law reduces the number of secure drop boxes from 40 in the county to eight, an 80 percent reduction. And those drop boxes are not accessible all through all time. And in terms of hours and days a week, they're going to be put inside voting places. And so you have to go inside during voting hours. Now, Obviously, people thought secure drop boxes were a good idea, or they wouldn't have made them available in the first place. So what we're now doing is we're restricting access to those secure drop boxes. In Fulton County, again, there were mobile polls for people who had to work. Remember, we're saying that those people who have to work every day, bus drivers, grocery clerks, a few months ago, we were saying they were our American heroes. Those are the people who don't get to take off from work. So they were mobile polls. We're going to restrict the mobile polls. We're going to reduce by more than half the period for people to request an absentee ballot. We're actually going to drastically reduce the period for early voting. And frankly, we're going to make it almost impossible to do it in the context of a runoff after another election. Importantly, with respect to provisional ballots, if someone moves and votes in another count in another precinct, it used to be that people would then go back to the original precinct. And if you hadn't voted there, in other words, if you hadn't voted twice, your vote would actually count. So what we're doing is in a, in a situation where black and non-white voters are already being denied the same access because they have to stand in much longer lines, we're actually making it much harder for people to actually cast their votes and then on top of the fact that people are standing in line for ungodly hours, we now make it illegal to give those people water when they're standing in line. Because, of course, we know from experience that only fraudulent voters get thirsty when they're standing in line for a long period of time. So if you take collectively all of those changes, what you've done is you've made it harder for people who live in the most populous areas, largely non-white voters, to vote. And I'll just make this following comment. The other problem with this as a prototype is what was the process that was followed here? Were there legislative hearings? No. Were there fact-finding commissions? No. Was there an opportunity for public comment? No. So there is no substantiated compelling evidence of voter fraud to justify these restrictions. So what we do is we raise the specter of voter fraud, and now we restrict legal voters, eligible voters' ability to cast ballots. And that's what's wrong with this bill, because democracy depends on every voter in this country having free and fair access to vote right. without discrimination and without undue hindrance. And this set of changes in this long bill, and it's a complicated bill, and I believe people think that they can get away with it because most people won't read the bill, okay? But in totality, these changes will make it much harder for certain voters to vote. Yeah, just right. one, one point, Andrew, that I would emphasize what we're asking is I frankly applaud what 
close to 60 companies did in signing a business statement opposing anti-LGBTQ state legislation, uh, stating their clear, clear opposition to this harmful legislation aimed at restricting the access of LGBTQ people in society. And what we're saying is, fundamentally, we want corporations to do the same thing here. Shepard Smith here. Thanks for watching CNBC on YouTube.